at ProPublica. Now, I imagine this immediately raises some follow-up questions for you. First of all, what is ProPublica? What is engagement journalism? And why on earth would you use such a thing to cover a tech company? The first one's easy. So ProPublica is a not-for-profit accountability outlet. Um, and that means that we don't do fashion, we don't do breaking news, we don't do a lot of important things that other news organizations do. We really only ever do stories where there is a powerful bad guy. So sometimes that's a politician, sometimes that's a company, sometimes that's just someone who really doesn't have a good, a good heart for humanity. Um, and engagement journalism is just one way of doing an accountability story like that. I like this chart because I think a lot of times as journalists, we end up very, very hyper-focused on our story. And that moment when we might hit a publish button and say, look, I'm done, I've published something, I am so important, look at my byline. But in reality, that's not how it works at all. The way that it works is that if it's a story important enough to cover, there's a group of people who cares about the issue and who are affected by that issue first. When you publish your story, those are hopefully the people who will read that story. And if it's a good story, hopefully something in their lives will change because you've shed some light on whatever the issue is. After you publish that story, that same group of people still exists, they're still out there, they're still talking and thinking about the issue. So we do engagement journalism to do more journalism because a lot of times the more stories that you do on a subject, the more stories you can do later. Better informed journalism because if you're talking to the communities who are affected by an issue, they also probably know quite a bit about it. So you go in with that much more knowledge and expertise from the people who care. If you think of the word community and substitute the word sources, it just means you have a lot more sources. And a lot of times it means you have a lot more good sources who know what it is that you should be thinking about. The more better, stronger sources you have, the better your stories, the more people trust you, the more loyal they are to you, the more they think to come to you for those issues. And also, once you publish, the more people who actually read it because you're writing something that's relevant to their lives. We talk about this as collaboration with a community, so writing about issues that people actually care about, and also hopefully at the end of the day, doing stories that help people and change their lives. And hopefully that's why we all got into journalism in the first place. So a lot of times when you see a crowdsourcing engagement project, it will start with words like this, like share your experience or help us investigate. Um, yesterday, someone mentioned the word citizen journalism, and this is just another version of that. The word that I like is crowdsourcing. How many of you know the word crowdsourcing? Anyone? Okay. There's a good definition from Columbia University. It says, journalism crowdsourcing is the act of specifically inviting a group of people to participate in a reporting task such as news gathering, data collection, or analysis through a targeted open call for input, personal experiences, documents, or other contributions. I'll give you just a couple of examples before we get to tech. So this is a, a project that some of my colleagues worked on last year. The United States has one of the absolute worst records on maternal health in, in, in the world. So that means a lot of mothers either die in childbirth or come very close. And when people first hear that statistic, it's kind of surprising. Um, we don't know the problem here is that we know that it happens. We know that it's bad. We don't know much more than that. So we have an estimate that 700 to 900 women die in childbirth every year. When we started, we only knew who about 50 of those women are. 
And if you don't know who the women are, you don't know what happened to them, and you don't know what the problem is that you might need to fix in our medical system. So this seemed like a natural crowdsourcing project for us because we could figure out who are these women and what are the problems in their lives. So we made a questionnaire where we asked people to answer a few questions. And as they answered the questions, new ones would populate. Um, and the very first one is either I almost died giving birth, I know someone who died giving birth, or I know someone who almost died giving birth. And we posted this questionnaire everywhere where we thought women or people who know these women might see it. So that would include places like Cosmopolitan Magazine, um, some Spanish language publications, and we partnered with the Texas Tribune in this situation because we had a tip that Texas was a place where this problem might be especially bad. So we reached out to all these people in the community, and what ultimately came out was, I think, a really powerful series of like, very, 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 very sad articles. Another example, so the company IBM has a presence here, right? They're in South Korea, IBM, yeah. So they're huge, this is a big old company, and they're really not doing very well. And over the last couple of years, what that has meant is that they fired a lot of people. And we were working on a project about age discrimination. In the US, it is illegal to fire older workers and just because you want to replace them with younger workers. And it's illegal, and there are laws on the books. People do it anyway, and they often get away with it. So we got a tip from a group of former IBM workers that said, hey, you're covering this issue. It's happening to us. Just look at all of these places on the internet where people who used to work for IBM have gotten together and are saying, I think I was fired because I was older. Look at these documents someone gave me. Everyone in my unit was above 50. How did this happen? So we decided that because this appeared to be an open secret, none of these workers could prove it by themselves, but perhaps we could crowdsource. So we made another questionnaire, um, another set of questions, interviewed a lot of people to decide what to put in it so we could get specific information back, and asked all of those communities, like that Watching IBM Facebook page I had up before, LinkedIn groups, support groups where people who were looking for jobs would get together and talk to one another, conference calls, all different places where IBM workers helped us figure out what was actually going on. And they did. So by the end of this project, we had talked to 2,000 IBM workers. And they talked to us because they were mad. They were really mad. They just lost their jobs. Not only were they mad, they felt ignored. Like they'd been talking about this all over the internet. They'd complained to their bosses. They'd called lawyers. And no one seemed to care about an individual laid off worker saying, I think I'm part of a pattern because they couldn't show the pattern. So we'd stumbled upon this very engaged community and it was a community who really wanted to help us. So they sent us tips, they sent us leaks, they sent us documents, they sent us to the human resources representative who they never in a million years thought would talk but eventually, when they had reporters calling, finally did. And it turned into a story. So ultimately, we as journalists could take all of these disparate pieces of information, put them together, go to the company, and say, what do you have to say about this? OK, so now on to the main event. Raise your hand if you use Facebook. Yeah. The important thing to remember here, Facebook, like most tech companies, is a business. And a business's goal is to make money. Tech companies make their money secretly. <laughs> so they keep their algorithms, which is a word that's come up quite a bit, secret, 
because at the end of the day, that proprietary information, information that only they know, is their secret sauce. But really, how does Facebook make its money? You, all of us, Facebook users. We know this because we see what comes out of an algorithm, and that's advertising. I'm gonna, this is a video that we put on Facebook last year for Facebook users that summarizes it far more succinctly than I can. Computers make a lot of decisions for us. Sometimes it's as simple as guessing what news we want to read. And sometimes it's as complex as guessing whether somebody will go on to commit a violent crime. When the algorithm used to make those decisions isn't transparent to the user, we call it a black box. Episode 1, Profiling. I'm Julia Angwin, Senior Reporter at ProPublica. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to show you some of the most common black box algorithms that you interact with on a daily basis and what they might mean for our future. First up, are you being optimized or monetized? Two-thirds of Americans own a smartphone. One in five Americans own a smart TV. One in five Americans say they go online almost constantly. Over a billion people across the world log on to Facebook every day. That's a lot of data. And these companies that build our favorite digital tools don't just collect data, they monetize it. Companies are competing to see who can get the most data on you and then offer it to advertisers. You are not their customer, you are what they sell. Case in point. Facebook knows who all your friends are, has seen all your photos, uses facial recognition, knows all your devices, knows where you live, and on and on. But it's not enough. They still buy data from data brokers about your offline life to enhance their file on you. Like what car you drive, the cost of your mortgage, and what you buy at the supermarket. Even though this data is often sloppy or inaccurate, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Why do this? To serve you targeted ads, of course. They call this the optimization of your Facebook experience. But maybe more accurately, it's the monetization of your behavior. We live in an era where more data is available about human behavior than ever before. As computers take in all this personal information, they increasingly spit out predictions about our lives. This can create what we call machine bias. Okay, so I show you that. I show you that because we put that video up on Facebook because we were asking Facebook users to help us do something. And we needed them to be mad. We needed them to understand that there was a story worth covering. Because, so we don't know what Facebook puts into its algorithm. That's a secret. That's a black box. We do see, as users, tiny pieces of the information that that algorithm spits out. So this is an example. Um, on Facebook, there's a little tab. It's like buried way deep in there that tells you why you're being targeted by certain ads. Um, this one's one of mine. I think these are very strange. It thinks I'm interested in the Brooklyn Museum, the state of Illinois, um, the city of Minsk. I don't know. It also, um, another even weirder tab, it thinks I do like dogs, but it really thinks I like dogs. Um, pet sitting, like leisure. I don't know who, who doesn't like leisure, but that's okay. Um, and all of these things, they're not just little pieces of information about me. What they are are ad categories. So all of that data and all of that information that I've plugged into Facebook, it's taking that and combining it with the information everyone else is putting into Facebook and slicing and dicing us into patterns that only its machine knows. And so I know that I am not the only Facebook user who Facebook thinks likes pet sitting because it's a big enough category that it exists in the first place. Um, you can see this on your own. And what this was before my time, but what we did at ProPublica was all of that little piece of information that it was spitting out for individual users, 
we decided to try to collect that ourselves. So we built a Google Chrome extension and a Firefox extension that went into that secret tab on Facebook and copied all of those ad categories so we could start to get a sense of the just immense variety out there. And that required, of course, asking Facebook users and people in that community to help us. And eventually, that started to lead to stories. So we realized that those, despite all of the strange things that pop up on ad categories about me, there was a whole lot that Facebook wasn't telling us at the same time. Another way to get a sense of how your data is filtered into ad categories is that you can become an advertiser yourself. You can start buying ads. So we do that, um, I, I do that all the time. After the election, we bought a bunch of ads on this page asking people to help give us tips and sources and stories. And we started to notice some pretty interesting categories that existed in the ad portal. For example, so in the US, it's illegal to target ads, which means you buy, choose ad categories for housing, employment, or credit based on categories protected by civil rights law. So that's race, gender, sex, age, ability, um, and, and more. But Facebook and their ad portal let you do that. Not only did they let you do that, they had some pretty ugly other categories that they'd crowdsourced from user data as well, um, including this one, which last year called Jew haters, and a bunch of other categories that were targeting people based on religion, and other just hatred that perhaps their algorithm, had it been run by humans, would not have let through. This is not the end. Once you, like I said, once you start with an engagement project, you often end up doing more journalism and better and better and better journalism from it, to the point where we realized that one of the reasons Facebook lets you target ads in these ways is because that's how people want to use it. So if I targeted an ad only to the men in this room, none of the women in this room would know what I said. And if I targeted an ad only to the women in this room, the men would have no idea that that ad had run. Now, probably I don't have anything secret to tell either gender here, but if I were a politician running for office and I wanted a certain kind of voter to come out and vote for me, it's a problem if not everyone knows what you're saying. So we asked users for help again. We have a big election coming up. And this was another Chrome and Firefox extension where we asked people to basically donate all of the ads that they were receiving on their Facebook feed to what we call the political ad collector. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. You add it, it copies ads. Um, it's not really that complicated. It's just this little thing that exists. We don't know who the people installing it are. All we see are the ads. It's pretty private. And we take those copies of those ads and we put them up into a place where everyone can see them. Um, and I can send you the links afterwards. So we put them up in a place where everyone can see all of the ads. So not all the men can see the ads targeted to women, the women can see the ads targeted to older people, etc. It's not fancy, it's just this, it's a collection of ads. And by itself, this isn't that exciting, like who really wants to look at more advertisements for more politicians? We also, we asked people to help us figure out which ads were political and which ones weren't, um, which helps train an algorithm of our own, which decide, helps us figure out what kinds of ads are out there. And none of that's exciting until you start to notice patterns or you start to see people using the platform in ways that are wrong. So for example, one story that we did from this project last year like I was saying earlier, you can't target employment ads based on age. We found a bunch of employment ads targeted based on age. So lots of companies of all kinds saying, we have this job available, and if you're over 35, you can't see that ad. So 
it let us find examples of people misusing the system, go back to Facebook and say, what's going on in that algorithm that makes this OK? Um, and it requires more than once. So that was a story from last December. This is a story from a month ago, because turns out there are still employers targeting employment ads, help wanted ads, only to men or only to women. And we find examples of this based on what users have donated to our database. This is not just for ads. Um, we've done other stories about Facebook using crowdsourcing. For example, um, a story that's been in the news a lot recently, Facebook has, a, they do, moderate hate speech. So if you see something on Facebook that you believe should not be there, you can go in and report it and say, I think that this is hateful, it's offensive, it's problematic. Um, and what that does is it triggers an algorithm that then, in theory, sends that either on to a human or makes a decision by itself. And last year, one of my colleagues, I'm Julia, who was just talking, she got a tip the traditional way, where she got this leaked slide deck of information that they use to train the human beings who are supposed to make decisions about what is hateful and what is not. And in that slide deck, um, this is the headline, Facebook secret censorship rules protect white men from hate speech, but not black children. And in the US, this caused a pretty big outrage because people were like, "That's, I understand that this is a machine and you have to make decisions based on very black and white categories, but this is bad. However, this is only half the story. So we know part of what went into the algorithm, as Facebook would say, we don't know what this means in practice. So we decided to find out. We asked people, have you ever reported hate speech on Facebook? Have you ever been reported for hate speech on Facebook? Can you give us examples of this algorithm at work? Because we can't see what goes in, but we can hopefully start to see what comes out. To do that, we needed to find Facebook users. So this was a project that took place primarily on Facebook. Um, we called this the Facebook Hate Investigator Bot which is a very long name for a little thing. Um, but basically, we asked all of our Facebook followers, Facebook users of all kind, to send us a message that would then take you through a series of questions where they'd give us specific pieces of information that we could then file away and turn into a limited but still useful data set where we could start to understand if you have a post like this, language like this, what happens. In an engagement project like this, though, we couldn't only talk to Facebook users on Facebook because we knew one result, so one thing that can happen if you are reported for hate speech is that you might get kicked off of Facebook. So we talked to a lot of people who maybe um, they were activists of some kind and they'd been flagged or had trolls attack them and gotten kicked off the platform. So we also had to come up with alternatives to make sure that the entire community was included. Um, and we were not the only ones covering this story. In fact, we were far from the only ones covering this story. We, um, and that actually worked to our advantage in this case because people kept getting mad. So there were stories breaking all around the world about how these algorithms were failing people. And we could start to figure out when that was happening and just jump on those bandwagons. So to try and find the mad, engaged people and ask them to help us. We also, um, we knew that when people got mad, they felt ignored. So they'd get this message from Facebook after you report something. And Facebook would write back to you and say, thanks for reporting. We're so sorry you were offended. But this thing that we're leaving up, it's, it's going to stay up. So we started to find all these trigger points that were making people angry and the like, specific language that was ticking them off and started actually buying ads around it, which was pretty fun. Oh, just got cut off. Um, but to that recipe of mad plus ignored, it worked here again. We had about 1,000 people participate. And 
A thousand people, about when you're talking about Facebook users, is tiny. That's nothing at all because there are two billion Facebook users. But what we can do as journalists is we're not just talking about those thousand users. We are also threatening to write a story, and we can go to the company and say, please explain. So that's what we did. We have a louder voice than any of those single individual users. We picked 50 examples and made Facebook walk us through why did each of these either get left up or get taken down. Um, and in 22 of those cases, Facebook said, yeah, that was a mistake. Our algorithm is broken. And it was the kind of story that we just couldn't have done unless people had helped us. We also put up all of those posts. So this is not the kind of story that you do once. It's a story you do over and over again. I mean, we're not doing it over and over again. But we want people to take that impetus to be able to say, this appears to be hateful by Facebook standards, this doesn't, and ask all of the follow-up questions that, to your common sense or mine, that might raise. So where does that leave you as Korean journalists? And, and I've been talking to people here who say Facebook is not the biggest tech company in Korea, but that there are these other platforms where you have thousands upon thousands of messages every day. To be honest, I don't know, but I have a feeling you do. Um, and I can imagine that in a universe where you have thousands of messages and angry people commenting, there are probably a lot of stories. Okay, that's all I have. Questions? Yes. 뜻깊은 강의해 주신 아리아나 토빈 기자님께 감사드립니다. 이제 질의응답 시간을 가지도록 하겠는데요. 첫 번째 질문 보시도록 하겠습니다. 한 편의 스토리를 만들기 위해 대략 몇명 정도가 팀을 이루고 있는지 그리고 팀은 어떻게 구성되었는지 궁금합니다. That's a good question. So every single story is different. For some of those stories, it might be one of us, it might be two of us. For other stories, it requires a programmer. So the ones where you have a Chrome extension or a Firefox extension, you'll have someone who knows how to build a Chrome extension or Firefox extension. Um, you also usually have someone who is more of a straight reporter. So someone who's on the beat and going to the press conferences and getting those secret tips. Um, and then sometimes an engagement reporter like me, sometimes um, so someone to build a site in the end to show the story, always an editor, so we never are totally left off to our own. Um, on a story like um, after we've done it once, it's easier the next time. So the story about age discrimination on Facebook took four or five people. The story about gender discrimination in job ads, that only took you know, one and a half because we'd already built the system to do it. 네, 다음 질문으로 넘어가도록 하겠습니다. How many developers were working full time on developing the Facebook political ad collector Chrome extension and for how long? And also, how does Julia Engwin's a departure affect ProPublica's technical investigations? Um, so it affects me because it makes me sad because she was a coworker I love. But in general, I think it's better to have more people out there doing more of this work. It's really important. We're planning to partner. I talk to her all the time. So in general, I think it's just more people on the beat doing more of the work in good and exciting and interesting ways. The political ad collector, that project, it was started by one developer. Eventually, I think at its peak, there were three on the team working on it. Now we are back down to one. So it's gone up and down. 네, 다음 질문으로 넘어가도록 하겠습니다. 프로퍼블리카가 비영리 언론으로 알고 있는데 만약 때로 알려야 하는 진실이 후원자의 대다수가 추구하는 가치, 믿던 진실과 다를 경우에 
어떻게 보도하시는지요? 그리고 그럴 경우 후원자가 감소하는 것을 경험해 보신 적이 있으신지 그리고 이런 경험을 통해 프로퍼블릭하는 어떻게 비영리 언론의 모델을 만들어가고 계시는지 궁금합니다. So ProPublica is a non-profit, um, which means for the, we do have sponsors, we have donors. The good thing is that as a reporter, I don't know who they are. So they don't tell me who our sponsors are. And so when and they don't tell my editors who our sponsors are. So when it comes time for me to write a story or for one of our editors to approve a story and to put it all the way through, we don't even know who we might be making angry or not. Um, I think from what I understand about the development side, which development means fundraising, they don't let people become a sponsor and promise anything at all. Um, I do, sometimes it means if we get a specific grant to cover, say, um, we have a grant to cover hate in the US and hate crimes, or a grant to cover technology, it might mean we cover a subject, but we won't accept money if it means we have to cover it a certain way. Um, I don't, I, I, all I know about our funding is that in the past couple of years, it's actually gone way up because for the first time, we have lots of people making smaller donations. So individuals like you who might say, I'm going to donate $25 or $5 or $50 at a time um, because I think people are first after certain elections realizing the value of news. Um, and as Rosenthal was saying during his presentation, we've been one of the lucky beneficiaries of that.